Hello, and welcome to the next episode of the Live Your Spa Life Show. Spa life is a lifestyle that accepts that accomplishment and harmony coexist. The spa and spa life is for seek power always, that power within you to do your deeper work in the world. I am so delighted to introduce uh, my special guests. I've got two of them here today. They are quite a dynamic duo here. Sarah O'Mara and Yvonne Federson were just two friends. Who, and they were also young actresses in 1959. They were performing at a USO tour in Japan when they stumbled upon 11 young orphans in need of loving homes. What happened next would take them on a lifetime journey as they dedicated their lives to fighting child abuse and neglect abroad and then in the United States. They founded Child Help, the nation's oldest and largest nonprofit dedicated to fighting child abuse and neglect and still lead the organization today. Child Help operates programs across the country in addition to Child Help National Child Abuse Hotline, which helps nearly 100,000 children in need every year, while Child Help has served more than 11 million children, you heard me, 11 million children and families throughout their 61 year history. Ladies, welcome to the show. Thank you, Thank you so you. much. We're happy to be with you. This is so wonderful and such an honor having you here and just your dedication over the decades. Um, I'd love for you just to share what was that like in terms of just this life altering shift from these, you know, young, beautiful actresses performing, thinking, you know, how your life was going to move forward. And this shift happened uh, with the with the children and changing that trajectory of your lives. Can you explain a little bit and share a little bit of that journey? Well, we were actresses, as you, as you said, at the time. And so we were entertaining the troops in Korea, Okinawa, and Japan. When we were in Japan, we hit the typhoon season, coldest winter they'd ever had on record. And we were not supposed to leave our hotel because of the conditions of the typhoon that struck the worst of its kind, they said. But we were young and we were adventurous. And so we snuck outside of the hotel down the steps of the uh, basement in order to see the devastation that had occurred from the typhoon. And as we did, we came across 11 little children huddled together to fend off the cold. And they didn't have shoes on nor jackets. And we tried to converse with them and ask them where they belong. Uh, and they couldn't understand us nor we understand they, but then they um, explained no mama-san, no papa-san. So we thought, well, they've either been displaced from their families or their orphans or whatever. So we took them back to our hotel room and gave them a hot bath and fed them and then tried to find orphanages that would take them. Uh, as we did, uh, every orphanage was overcrowded from the typhoon and could not take them. So we had to sneak them back up to our hotel room. They spent the night and we started our uh, journey the next day doing the same thing and finally when we reached an orphanage the children began to cry in unison they did not want to go in and we realized uh, when the uh, person that ran the orphanage explained to us that he had had to turn them out of the orphanage because they were half American half Japanese children and they received no stipend for that child, only the full-blooded Japanese child. And so we took them back to our hotel room, approached the Colonel that was overseeing our tour since we were entertaining the servicemen. And uh, he helped us find a woman that took in half American children, but we were dismayed because she had a little hut and only had 10 children herself huddled together around a uh, hibachi to keep warm. And we explained to her if she would take our half American children, we would take care of the ones she had as well. She trusted us and we came back the next day after entertaining that night and telling the servicemen about what we had found that day on the streets. And we said, listen, some of these may be yours, you have to help us. So we passed the hat and we uh, sent home for money uh, in order to sustain them. But what, what happened, we were not really geared for. And that was that people started leaving these children on the doorstep, up the block, down the street with notes pinned on them for the orphanage of mixed blood. So 
we found that we were caring for over 100 children in our care before you knew it. And uh, then that is what caused us when we came back to the States to begin International Orphans Incorporated. We ended up building four orphanages for the half American child. And then we in were Japan. in Japan. And then we were asked to go into Vietnam and do the same thing. So we had nine orphanages total, a uh, hospital for children, and we had a school in Vietnam for the children. Wow. So that's how we began. Now here we were actresses planning one, one part of our career and ended up taking care of children <laughs> instead. Wow. Well, you know, was there any part along the journey? I mean, I can see how you could just completely get caught up in, in wanting to take care of the children. And, and, you know, you've often asked yourself, well, you know, if not you, then who is actually going to do this? When you were in this, I mean, you were very young in your careers. You, I'm mm -hmm. sure, had aspirations to do more with that. Um, how did this shift in your trajectory? How did that, you know, change your life? Do you feel like there was a, a point where you just said, you know what, now this is, this is our life. This is what we're doing. Uh, how is it that you just decided to, to take this path? Because, you know, frankly, people could look at this and go, you know, it's a one-time thing. This is not mine to do. How is it that you actually took it as, as your mission in life? Well, how we changed to helping children here, we were speaking at a luncheon in California where we lived at the time. And Nancy Reagan and her husband, of course, was, uh, he was the governor of California at the time, Ronald Reagan. Uh, they were on the dais with us. They spoke and we spoke. And after we spoke, Nancy Reagan said, you are just the ones to do it. And we said, do what? And she said, help the abused and neglected children here, because you took on those children in Japan and Vietnam, and we feel that we need to help the children here in America. And we said, well, we've never heard about child abuse. We don't think that anyone would abuse their children here in America. We were so naive. But she said, oh, yes, it's a very big problem. And we said, well, we feel that we need to get, do a, a study on it. So we need some money to be able to do that. And she's first before we could take on another project. And she said, well, I think we know where we can get the money for you. And she kind of winked at her husband, Ronald. And, and, and he said, yes, of course, we can get you the money. And the next morning, they had sent us a check because they thought it was so important for us to do this work. So we did the study. And of course, we found out that a lot of abuse was going on at that time. And of course, it's greater now than it's ever been. So that's how we began our work. And but you know, when Yvonne said that we were naive at the time, so was America. Nobody right. believed that child abuse was happening. And that's why we had to step in and change laws because uh, they were not facing it. And those that did report child abuse could be sued because if a court found that a child could have fallen down the steps instead of being abused, right. let us say. They believe the parents. Then they, yes, then they, they blame the parents they, and those parents could sue. So we uh, first began by ch helping to change those laws. Right, right. Well, and we had wonderful volunteers. When we mm -hmm. came back from Japan and our trip overseas, we got a, together our friends and we started chapters in California. That's where we lived, of course. And so we have still many chapters in California as well as other states where we are. But they were wonderful to help us and they were special friends to the children overseas and then they became special friends to the children here. But we all worked together to raise funds to help the children here and it's grown over the years. And now, as you said earlier, we're one of the oldest and, and largest organizations helping abused and neglected children. Right, well, and you've had you know the unique perspective to see this over decades and see you know what has happened in terms of who's been there to help the children, what type of resources have been out there. Um, but as you mentioned, you know, it's as, as big as ever, if not bigger, and it's becoming more of an awareness for people to see how big the problem is. What have you seen that has worked uh, in helping children? And where do you feel like, you know, it's kind of falling short? Well, well, all of our programs are fantastic. We have prevention programs in the schools. We have hotline and our hotline has gone up 40 percent since all of this has happened this past year and we have texting on our hotline and we have um, uh, advocacy centers and we have two 
wonderful villages where children live 24 seven, one on the East Coast in Virginia, and one in California, in Beaumont, California. We have group homes and foster homes. So we do a little bit of everything and we find all of our programs work well. Of course, you can have a good program written down on paper, but it takes a good staff to carry it off. And these, we have wonderful staff that work with our children day in and day out. And we love it how we are able to take these children and they come in so abused and neglected and, and so down on themselves and blame themselves. And we are able to work with these children and turn their little lives around and help them to become the beautiful person that God intended them to be. You know, through the continuum of services uh, to which she referred, um, that is a very important thing in order to uh, receive the call and um, then be able to help children in various ways. It may not be the same child, but it helps so much in our research and knowing exactly how long it takes a child to recoup. Of course, every child is different, but uh, that has helped tremendously. One of the things <clears throat> that we really uh, tout a lot is the fact that we have a prevention program. You want to get out in front of the problem if you possibly can. So while our programs are wonderful and we have to help the children that have already been abused, if we can stop it before it begins, that is the real uh, answer to everything. So our program, uh, Child Help Speak Up, Be Safe, is in almost every state in the United States, and it is in 18 different countries. We're on 13 military bases uh, with our prevention program. We really uh, think that's one of our most favorite programs, that and the hotline, because it does step out in front of the problem, and you don't have to to uh, take an abused child all through the facets that they have to go through, we, if we can prevent it. Right, oh, that, that is so important. I remember when I was with the police department, that was one of the mm -hmm. most heart-wrenching things is to have to take a child out of a home, you know, where that's all they know, even if it's an abusive home, it's still a shift and a change for them. And the more that you can uh, give them the support to, uh, you know, keep their family intact or to have, you know, the services that they need because, you know, no one was taught how to parent, right? And there's a difference exactly. between not being a good parent and being an abusive parent. and you know, any of those, those programs, it's amazing that you've been able to support and help with that. Uh, you know, we hear a lot of things too, and you, you may have heard this as well, in terms of, you know, a lot of times with the, the foster cares and the different systems that there's some re-traumatization that happens. Um, how is it that you guys are able to stay ahead with, with your staff? Is there in-house training? Is there ways um, to make sure that the people that are, are meant to, uh, to help the children, that they don't become part of the problem? We do have in-house training, a, a lot of it. It's, it's very important. Uh, it's not easy to take on an abused child. Remember that they're very angry when uh, on the inside, especially if they're a little older. Uh, they are testing all the time <laughs> just to say, do you really love me? Do you really care? And so uh, we do take our hats off to our staff because they go through a lot. It's, it's important uh, to know how to deal with abused children. The number one thing is to give them love. If they can be reached by love. You know, um, as we look back over the 60 some odd years that Yvonne and I have been in this, it takes more than grit and perseverance. It takes a lot of faith. You know, we have to do our duty, but then we have to turn it over to God to do the rest. And uh, if there's a, ever an answer as to why we have been successful, that is it. It really deals with faith. So if we can give that to the children, then we have given them something that will last a lifetime. And we do work on that. We have chaplains, uh, non-denominational chaplains at our villages and meditation rooms in all of our programs. That's extremely important. We've always dedicated our organization to God and we believe in miracles and we've had many, many miracles over these 61 years. <laughs> I love that. Well, if, if it wasn't uh, for faith, I don't know how a lot of people would have gotten through this last year. I think having that foundation. That's, true. That's right. 
<laughs> if you don't have that, then you are lost on, on a whole different level. So I, I love that, 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 uh, you know, faith and, and, you know, there, you can do everything you can do and then give it over. Uh, and I know for, for you ladies, you're known for, you know, not taking no for an answer and, and having that, uh, slogan of where there's a That's way. For sure. way. <laughs> so, you know, maybe you guys have a couple like stories or incidences where, you know, you maybe had to just push a little harder to, to get what, what, uh, what you needed to support. Uh, cause you, I can tell that you guys have a lot of spunk and that you've gone out on a limb for your children, uh, in, in a lot of different ways. So how is it that you've overcome maybe some of the obstacles of, of people saying no, and, and you not taking that as an answer? Well, I think, it goes back again uh, to our faith and looking to God for it to open the impossible doors because uh, we have had to really face a lot of the, um, the, the licensing and the things of that nature that you have to go through in order to open programs. And the everything way- Everything has been a challenge. Everything. Every program we've opened, everything has been a challenge. It has. And you just have to, to not stop. You have to persevere. You, you have to uh, stay on course and you have to know that you're going to get there in the end because it's God's work and he wants this to take place. And therefore he has to help us. And uh, we have seen miracle after miracle, uh, truly with doors opening and things that it might seem impossible and, and were actually impossible if it had not been that we had that divine help. Uh, so if there's an answer to anything about what we've done, it is that we are known uh, in child help to be first, as they call us, F-I-R-S-T-S. And that is because we opened the very first residential treatment center strictly for abused children in the United States. We had the first hotline and still the only hotline after 30 some odd years uh, that uh, have only degreed professionals answering the phone. And then we have the prevention program and we have, uh, and that was a first, we have from kindergarten through high school, we're still the only ones that have that number, uh, well, evidence-based. So uh, we were the first ones to have uh, foster care for siblings. Uh, we were the very first ones to, um, have villages that also had foster homes that the children could go into after they reached the step system. We had group homes and foster homes. So in a way, we're known as, as kind of the lamplighters and do certain programs. We um, really were the very first ones to have advocacy centers and the very first one to have everything under one roof. In other words, when a child is brought in by the police or the social services department, uh, they used to have to go to every different uh, building, every different place, make all these different appointments. We have everything under one roof. We have uh, 70 police in, in our building uh, in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, we also have an advocacy center, the same uh, modality in Tennessee. And uh, we have the uh, therapists, we have um, a unit of the uh, social service department we have a unit of the children's hospital. So everything takes place under one roof. So what used to take sometimes even months before a case was determined, we can do that within a four hour time or less. So that cuts down on the trauma of, right. of child abuse. But I think that if you could say, well, well uh, why have you been so successful? It is, of course, that we give um, faith as the answer, God, but it's also that we don't give up. We know that if something is right to do, somehow, some way, that this will be done and it will get done. You know, and it always has. God never said it would be easy, but we know that he'll always be with you when you know something is right for you to do. And if you have a mission, which we know we have, and we feel our volunteers feel the same way, that it's their mission too, because we've had many members stay with us 40 and 50 years. That's a long time. Wow. So it's become their mission also. They love the children and they love to see the changing children that happen at our programs, through our programs, at our villages and everywhere. 
I love that so much. And you ladies are known for bringing those miracles and doing the impossible. I'd love for you to share a little bit about Operation Baby Lift because that yes. could have been a very, uh, you know, changing pivotal moment where, you know, a lot of children could have been left behind. So I'd love for you to share um, the miracle of that. Well, we were asked uh, by Congress actually to go into Vietnam to take care of the half American, half Vietnamese children like we had done in Japan. And so, as I earlier stated, we built five orphanages, hospital, and a school there. Well, when we were told that we were pulling out of Vietnam, uh, we worked with General Lewis W. Walt at the time, um, overseeing everything for us. And when he told us that we had to, they were pulling out, so do, so do not send any more funding over to care for our orphanages. We said, well, we can't leave the children there because the Viet Cong will kill them because of their mixed blood. And he said, now don't start on me because he was a big teddy bear, loved the children, but he, he had to get all of these troops out. And um, that was his, his main job to do, his main responsibility. Ours was to get the children out. Right. And so uh, we kind of raised Cain about getting airplanes in there to get the children out. Mm -hmm. And uh, through, through Congressman, uh, our own Congressman Corman was the one that really initiated that for us so that we could say, look, you asked us to go in and do this. We've done this. We've saved these children. And now we want to really save them because they won't be saved. And uh, we helped organize the Vietnam baby lift and, and bring children to this country. Uh, it was so that the last plane that took off, that uh, there were children in China Beach lined up on the beach and shot. And so um, they would, these children would have been killed indeed. But there were a lot of loving homes, caring people that were waiting for these children. We had them adopt, every one of them adopted before they um, even reached our soil. We were not an adoption agency, but we worked with other adoption agencies to get these children, these homes when they would land here. And I must say at that time, that was the most emotional time I think we've ever had in our history because these little babies, here they were put on little boxes. They had taken the seats out of the plane and put the babies in boxes and the children who were large enough to sit in the seat, we're sitting in seats. But our volunteers would go up the back steps of a plane, go down the aisle, pick up a child, and then walk out the first, the, the front of the plane. And then we'd go into the naval base in um, Long, Long Beach. Beach. And it was so emotional to think that these children had been taken away from their parents, put on a strange plane, taken across here to America, they didn't know where they were going. Of course, babies didn't realize it, but the older children did. And they would go into the base and wait for the parents to come. And we had a volunteer stay with the babies and all of the children until their parents would arrive. And it was really a time, I think, that those who were volunteers at that time with us will never forget that. Right. And I think that that's really a part of our history that, that really meant a lot to all of us. And, and wasn't this like 2,000 children? I mean, oh, yeah, at yeah. least, I mean, many more than that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're not you, talking you just know, a handful of children. This is a major operation to be able to move that many children that quickly. Yes, and we've met a lot of the children. One child oh, yes. uh, in, in San Diego um, that we have kept in contact with became uh, a doctor uh, and she, uh, I mean, a lawyer. lawyer, a lawyer. And, uh, there's another one, a doctor, but uh, she became a lawyer to defend abused children, and she's doing that to this day. Wow. So we have wonderful stories to tell about these children. Eva, I mentioned the parents, but those that we put on the plane mostly did not have parents. However, there were some parents that just shoved their babies at us on the plane trying to get on they because knew, they knew that yeah. their child would be safe picture. in America. Wow. Wow. Such, such a, you know, timing is everything. And to just be able to, uh, you know, kudos to you ladies to just really push this through because I mean, you know, in wartime, there's so many things happening. They've got to look about the troops. They've got to, you know, look exactly. at the political positioning. I mean, there's so many things that come into that and to keep uh, your, your focus on the children and supporting them um, is just so commendable. 
Uh, I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit, shift a little bit about how has this impacted your personal life and your, your personal way of, you know, because I can think something when you have such a big passion like this, I can imagine it's all consuming where it can almost feel like you're doing it 24 seven. How has this uh, impacted your personal life? Well, fortunately, our husbands um, were very close as well. They, I think they had to be. <laughs> I think that's part of the deal. Yeah, yes, part, that's of, the part deal. of the deal. And so uh, they had each other, but we became a family unit uh, in working for uh, child help. Our children were brought up uh, doing things for the first village, as a matter of fact, trying to prepare that first village. We painted it. We we really uh, had to work um, almost a year to get it going. And so <clears throat> our children spent their holidays and everything at the village site, helping us get it ready. So it has been part of their DNA, let us say, from the very beginning. Right. And so um, my son, uh, as an example, is now head of the IT and also Sense. the Child Help Speak Up Be Safe departments of all of child help nationally. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's become a part of his life as it has mine. And our children, uh, you might say it was kind of a force upon them, but they really genuinely cared uh, about what we were doing. Right. Well, and, and our husbands were wonderful to support us mm -hmm. because it would have been awfully hard if they hadn't. Right. Absolutely. And just kind of made this a, a family affair and a family uh, mission to be able to move forward. And, you know, but there, there's so much outpouring, you know, especially with children, you know, because there's always a need that needs to happen um, with with a child. It's kind of not, never ending. What are some of the things that you do to fill yourself back up so that you have the, the energy and, and, you know, grit and perseverance to continue for so long? I think God gives us a lot of that energy. <laughs> and we have each other, which is nice. We've lost our husbands. And um, we live together now, share a home. But um, we've always been together over these 61 years and we've had each other. And I think that's been great that we've had yeah. a partner like this. And like I said earlier, we have wonderful volunteers and they too have become such close friends and so dedicated. In fact, most of the people I think that we're really around are into our organization, helping their children. And uh, they love what we do and they're like-minded. And our spiritual part of our life is such a part of our life that that is very important. And I, that certainly has kept us going. We yeah. never want to let God down. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of your home, one of the questions I love asking my guests, because our listeners are always so curious, is that we have different experiences in different rooms of our home. We live differently in our kitchen versus our bedroom or our office. What is your favorite room in your home and why? I think it's in the kitchen because everybody <laughs> gathers there. Uh, but we each have an, a home office as well as our office that we do not go into now because of COVID. But um, we spend a lot of time in our individual home offices. Uh, however, we love to come in the kitchen and 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 uh, we have bedrooms on either side of the house and our offices on either side of the house. But we meet in the middle, and that's where the kitchen is, and our, where we're sitting right now is our living room. I'll bet you anything that most people tell you it's either the den or the living or, or the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it depends. It's just you know a wide range. Some people like their bedroom because it's their sanctuary. It's their only quiet, reflective. Maybe it's prayer time. You know, things that they get to have. But there's definitely something. You know, I've got a friend of mine that says life happens between the kitchen and the bathroom. It's like where everyone <laughs> gathers. <laughs> And where you get to connect, you know, and it, it's so important, uh, you know, especially over this last year where people haven't always connected uh, at the level they're used to. We are connective people, right? And the fact that you have each other, uh, you know, having just even one dear friend in your life can make all the difference uh, in the all world. The you know? And so when you have someone that's in it with you and has that same uh, faith base, has that same mission, has those things in common. Uh, I believe those are some of the things that really fortify you to really move forward and, and do the bigger things that, that you're here for to do. That's very true. Uh, yeah. So I'd like to, uh, one, uh, kind of end with uh, how people can help the children. Like, what is something that, that they can do with that? Um, let, let's just start with that. Well, 
if anyone wants to know more about child help and how they can help, they can go to child, www.childhelp.org and it tells you about our different programs and it leads you to where you can be of help. Um, of course, money is the resource that keeps us going, that we can help these children uh, and can give them love and, and keep them safe. So we appreciate people giving of their time, their effort, their caring hearts in order to raise funds for these children. And it's very innovative the way people have done this for child health and probably for other charities as well during this pandemic. Uh, they, we have had uh, virtual, so many, events. Yeah, virtual events, but we have also had different companies, even though they're having a rough time, they uh, have promoted child help and people love to uh, frequent places, whether it's restaurants or, or stores or whatever that will give back. And, and that's partly why they do it because they realize that people are good at heart at usually and that they want to give back. And so- um, we, you know, I think it'd be nice for us to thank all of those two at this time who have helped us through this time. This last year has been quite a challenge and many charities have had to close their doors for a while, but we've been very fortunate that we have made it through and we wanna thank all of those who have helped Child Help. Yes, because we couldn't do what we do uh, mm -hmm. without these people. Yeah. And without your listeners, that's right, who all of a sudden say, you know, I want to help a child. And right. uh, when they do that, they may never see that child. But let me tell you, it makes a difference in the world. And how we leave our next generation tells us who we were when we were on this earth. Absolutely. And that's one of the beauties of podcasting now is that you have no idea how far and wide that this can go. And, you know, just, you know, one person speaking to their heart and they, them giving from that place. I mean, this is why we talk about being a force for good, because it could be five people down the end that just decides they want to be a volunteer. They want to, you know, do some monthly giving. There's something that is speaking to their heart. Maybe exactly. something here is somebody who was on that plane. Right. And right. that's right. <laughs> we had a group who made masks for our children during the time of this epidemic. So, you know, there are all kinds of ways you can help these children. You can close toys besides money and opening the, the doors to help us to help them will mean so much. And we thank you in advance for those of you who are listening today. And you can always pray. Yes. Yeah. Anyone yeah. can pray. Absolutely. Well, ladies, any, any final thoughts about how you're being a force for good in the world and, and anything that our listeners need to hear? Well, we hope that we're being a force for good. That's our intention to be. But every single individual is brought in for a purpose. There's a divine plan for every single soul that is on this earth plane. And so if I were to leave uh, you with anything, I would like to say that everyone should feel worthy and important because nobody can do their job, that particular job of why they were brought into this earth. And so whatever you feel, you as an individual feel led that you were brought here for, for heaven's sakes, do it. Now is the time to get it done because the, I'll tell you right now, the United States needs a lot of good, force in order to come out of not just the pandemic, but our moral deficiency and the things that are happening in this world. But every single person can make a difference if they really want to. Every single person has talents, some more than others, but you all have some talent. And if you use your talent, not only to benefit you, but to benefit others, that's the secret to life. Get yourself out of the picture and see how you can help someone else and especially the children. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Sarah and Yvonne for sharing your pearls of wisdom, for leading by example, for being in the good fight uh, for so many decades and the impact that you've had on children. Um, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Us.
Absolutely. And to our listeners, you know, please look into our show notes, you know, check out childhelp.org, see, you know, where you're being called to help and support. We are trying to get out into the world and be a positive force for good, get positive messaging out there. And we do that by you subscribing, by you sharing, putting any of the comments in there. We're happy to answer any questions that you have and to get this out into the world. So until we connect again, live your spa life. Bye for now. Bye-bye. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. God bless you.